Please turn your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I trust you take great delight in that Christ died for you, but that he's alive today, isn't he? And he lives for you today. What is the greatest concern of, of your heart? What's the greatest concern of your heart? What's the greatest longing of your soul this morning? Now, it's very easy for earthly things to grasp our hearts, to grasp our attentions, to, to grasp our devotion and affections. If you've been with us, you know that the Thessalonian Christians hadn't been believers very long at all, uh, but they longed to be with Christ. The Thessalonian believers, they longed for Christ's return. And they became extremely disturbed when there were false teachers that came along. And they told them that Christ had returned. And they had missed it. And they were overwhelmed. They were distraught. They knew that this world held little for them. If you know the background of the Thessalonians, you know that, that they're going through great persecution. And so there was, there was nothing in this world for them. Christ was their greatest desire. And so it was relief to them when Paul assures them that they hadn't missed the return of Christ. We'll see that in the passage today, that they are assured that, no, you haven't missed the return of Christ. But the question for you this morning and for me is, would that even bother us? Or are we so involved in the, in the things of this world that we wouldn't have been that disturbed as they were disturbed? Beloved, God is bringing situations. Beloved, God is bringing circumstances into your life to wean you from too much love for the things of this world, even the good things of this world, so that you will long for Christ all the more. So that you will long for Christ's return all the more. And the passage that we're looking at this morning, this passage will help renew in you a longing for the return of Christ. Christ. And this is the perspective that we need for all of life. Although we're only going to look at verses 1 through 5 this morning of chapter 2, I'm going to read the whole passage all the way to verse 12 because it's one passage, but it's too much to look at in one Sunday morning. But it'll give you the context for what Paul is talking about. He encourages them that they could know a certainty they hadn't missed the return of Christ, that Christ was coming back for them. The Word of God says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception and wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved." For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who do not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. Let's look to the Lord before we look to his word. Lord Jesus, we are waiting for your return. 
We are longing for your return. You promised that you would return and you would gather your people to yourself. You promised that you would come back in magnificent glory and make all things right in perfect justice and perfect righteousness. And so we, we, your people, we wait for you. We long for your return. We see so much unrighteousness. We see so much injustice in our world. It's getting worse and, and worse. And Lord, it's very easy for us to get frustrated. It's easy for us to get fearful. But as things get worse and worse, Lord, may these things remind us that your return is drawing closer and closer. In Christ, we have to confess that, that we are so forgetful. At times, Lord, you know we live as if this life is all there is. Lord, we get caught up in the here and now, and we lose sight of your return. And so, Lord, thank you for the things that you bring into our lives that are a loving reminder that this world is not our home. And someday soon, someday soon, very soon, you are returning to take us to our eternal home with you. Lord, may every blessing you give to us remind us of our eternal home where we will have endless delight in you. And may every difficulty and struggle and sorrow cause a greater longing for your return when you will wipe away every tear and there will no longer be any mourning, crying, or pain. And so we look to your word this morning. Oh, Lord, open your word to us. Give us fuel in our hearts, a, a greater longing for your return. In your precious name we pray. Amen. As we look at this passage, the central point of this passage is that as Christians, we are called to be mindful of Christ's return to gather his people and judge the wicked. As Christians, we are called to be mindful, thoughtful of Christ's return where he will gather his people and will judge the wicked. We will see two main points in this passage. First of all, a call, an encouragement. Don't be disturbed. Don't be disturbed in verses 1 through 2. And then an encouragement. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived in verses 3 through 5. Let's look first of all. Don't be disturbed in verses 1 through 2. We need to step back a little bit and give a little background on this particular passage. Many New Testament scholars would consider this passage as one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult, in all of the epistles and letters in the New Testament. One commentator I read said, this passage is probably the most obscure and difficult in the whole of the Pauline correspondence, and the many gaps in our knowledge have given rise to the most extravagant speculations. It will be well for us to bear in mind that we do not possess the key to everything that's said here, and accordingly to maintain some reserve in our interpretations, unquote. I just give you that as a, a background as we look at this passage. Now, at Christ Road Bible Church, we just work our way through the Bible. We just work our way through books of the Bible so we don't avoid passages like this. Say, no, that one's too hard. That one's difficult. No, we just work our way through God's Word and let God's Word speak to us. And one of the reasons is this is difficult is that Paul in this passage, he refers to what he had taught them. Remember, Paul, he planted the church, and then he taught the believers in Thessalonica. There was a lot of oral, verbal teaching that he gave to them in person. But guess what? We don't have that. We don't have a record of exactly what Paul said when he verbally had taught them. So it's like we're given a, a puzzle with some pieces missing, and we aren't sure even how many pieces there are, and we aren't sure what they contain. And yet, beloved, that shouldn't cause us anxiousness. That shouldn't cause us concern. Why? Because you have and I have, we have exactly what the Holy Spirit wants us to have. He didn't accidentally leave something out that you really need. No, we have what we need to have so that we can live for God's glory and we can look forward to Christ's return. And it helps us understand, this background gives us an understanding that there are some different interpretations of this particular passage in when and how Christ will return and will gather his people. Look at verse 1 there. Paul says, Now we request of you, brethren, with regard to the, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. 
This word coming, it's the, it's the Greek word parousia. It's a term that Paul and, and others in the New Testament, they often used to refer to the second coming of Christ. This particular word is used 24 times in the New Testament, and 18 of those times it's used to refer to the coming, the return of Christ. And if you're familiar with the Gospels, you know that Christ over and over again in the Gospels during his earthly ministry, he promised he's going to come back. I'm coming back. In his first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul addressed this issue already. He addressed the issue of the second coming of Christ. He addressed the issue of Christ gathering his children. Why? If you remember when we went through 1 Thessalonians, what was the concern of the Thessalonian Christians then? Their concern was that they understood that Christ is coming back, but they understood that he's coming back, like, immediately in our lifetime. And what happened? There were some Christians, fellow Christians, that died before Christ came back. He hadn't returned yet. And so they were concerned. What's going to happen to them? And, and Paul assures them, no, don't be worried. Christ will gather those who have died in Christ first, and then we who are alive and remain will be gathered to meet him with the Lord in the air. But then, after that first letter, Paul becomes aware, and very likely it's possible, when Timothy comes back, he tells them of another concern that the Thessalonians have related to the coming of Christ and his gathering to his people. And that's one of the main reasons Paul writes this second letter, probably only a couple months after he wrote the first letter, because they're concerned. Well, what's their concern? You can see there at the end of verse 1, he says, We request you, brethren, regarding the coming of our Lord Jesus and are gathered together with him. Paul is talking about the, the return of Christ. We'll see in the next verse that they were concerned they had missed it. Christ had come back. They had missed it, and they were still there. So Paul speaks here of the, the coming of Christ. He speaks of the gathering together of Christ's people. Now, these aren't two distinct issues. The Greek grammar here in this past indicates that these are not two distinct and completely different events. They're, they should be understood as the same event or very closely identified events. Now, this is the sixth time in these two short letters that Paul has talked about Christ's second coming. So, Christian, do you think this is an important issue? Absolutely. That we would be concerned about, that we would be thinking about, that we would be living in light of Christ's second coming. That's why Paul talks about it so many times in this letter. Now, why does Paul need to write them about this? Look at verse 2. What does he say? that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. This word shaken here, it, it, it describes a, a ship that had been shaken loose from its moorings because of a great storm and it's just being cast on the, on the storm because it's not tied down fast. This word disturbed, it, it denotes a continual state of agitation and, and confusion. And the way that Paul writes here, it, it seems to indicate that, that he doesn't know exactly what had caused such a serious problem among the Thessalonian believers. It's only been a few months since they received Paul's first letter, and, and someone shows up. And they, they loved getting letters from Paul. They loved, loved getting messages from Paul. And, and someone shows up and says, we have another message from Paul. Well, what did he say? And this could have been someone that had some kind of a prophetic word that they said was by the Spirit's authority. Or it could have been an, an oral message that someone verbally said, we heard Paul say this. Or it's also very likely that this was a, a written letter, a forgery, that someone took the time to write as if it was from Paul so that they could deceive the Thessalonians with their false teaching. Now, that's probably no doubt why at the end of this particular letter, Paul writes in verse 17 of chapter 3, he writes, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. And this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. So he's making it very clear. No, this is the real deal. This is really from me. So when they receive this forged communication, what was the thrust of the message? What was the point of this false teaching that they had gotten? 
Look at the end of verse 2. It tells you the whole point of it was to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. The day of the Lord has come. Now, Paul has referred in his letters often about the day of the Lord. And the end of chapter 5, the beginning of chapter 5 in the last book, he said, For you yourselves know full well that the, here's the phrase, day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, particularly the prophets, many times the prophets talk about the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord was a day of judgment, but also was a day of rescue of God's people. And Paul had told them there was a a future day of the Lord that was coming when Christ, in a very overwhelming way, would rescue his people and would judge the wicked. And now they are being led along to believe It's happened. You're in the day of the Lord, and you missed it. You missed the coming of Christ, and and you're still here. And they're they're confused. They're shaken when they receive this forged communication as if the day of the Lord has already come. That's their concern. The day of the Lord had come, and they had missed it. Christ has come in his second coming. He gathered his people. He gathered all his people together. And they weren't with him. They were left behind. They had been concerned before when they thought that there were some fellow believers that had died and they had missed the day of the Lord. They had missed the return of Christ. Now it applies to them. We've missed it. They're even more concerned that Christ has come back and and we didn't go with him. And so this false teaching from these false teachers caused great perplexity. Can you imagine? Imagine if you were them. Imagine if your life is consumed with persecution, with difficulty. You've only been a believer less than six months. You've been a believer maybe four months. You're you're a baby in the Lord, and yet your life has been very difficult. There's lots of persecution. But what you've clung to, what you've clung to with great hope is no matter how bad this life is, no matter how bad persecution is, Christ is coming back for his people, and I will be taken with him. And now this false teaching comes along to say, nope, you're left with this, and that's all you have. And so because of that, they are disturbed. They are shaken. And Paul wants them, wants to be very clear that, that Christ is still coming back. And that's the point of this passage. We'll see in the, the remainder of the passage. Paul wants to make it very clear. No, Christ hasn't come back. No, you haven't missed it. No, what you were looking forward to, what you're clinging to as your hope, you must still cling to. In the next few verses, he's going to explain to them very specific reasons why they could be absolutely confident, why even today, us, we can be absolutely confident confident that the Christ hasn't come back yet. Yet we are still looking forward to him coming and his gathering together his people. So what are some implications of these first couple um, of verses? I think a first implication is, beloved, that we would anticipate Christ's return. Why was this such a problem for them? It's because they anticipated Christ's return so much. And if we didn't anticipate Christ's return, it wouldn't be that big of a problem. There's a renewed encouragement for us to live in light of Christ's soon return. We know better. We know that Christ hasn't come back yet. And the question for us, are we living in light of his soon return? Beloved, you and I, we will be standing before Christ far sooner than we think. It could be this year. It could be this week. It could even be today. Now, you may say, well, no, I'm young. I'm healthy. I'm strong. Beloved, all of us, all of us are only a heartbeat away from eternity. Even this week, we've had reminders of that. We're only a dotted yellow line away from a head-on collision that puts us at Jesus' feet. And even, even a long life, even if you live 100 years, it's going to pass in a moment in light of eternity. And so one of the implications of this passage is like the Thessalonians, we would anticipate standing before Christ and that we would wake up from spiritual sleep that sucks the intensity, that sucks the, sucks the passion out of your Christian life. 
The Apostle John said in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, very sober passage. Now, little children, don't you know he loved that? He calls us little children. Little children, abide in him. Why? Why should you abide in Christ in this life? So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Beloved, if we're honest, it's far too easy to get comfortable in this life, isn't it? Far too easy to try to orchestrate our circumstances, to try to orchestrate our, our situations and surroundings to provide ease and, and comfort and, and security in the here and now. Your best life now, that's all there is. Beloved, yes, God has blessed us. God has blessed us with so many things to richly enjoy, but there is a great danger that we can easily become too attached, too attached to the here and now. Beloved, today, what is it that distracts you from loving Christ above all things? What, what is it that distracts you from anticipating His soon return? Would you have been like the Thessalonians? Would you have been overwhelmed and disturbed because you thought that Christ had returned and you missed it? Or would it not have bothered you that much? Well, it bothered them because they longed to be with Christ. And we need to cultivate that same longing. We must spiritually wake up. We must refuse to live a, a mediocre Christian life, to avoid, avoid average Christianity at all costs, that we would seek to live fully with our eyes fixed on the prize, the soon return of Christ, or are going to be with Him in death. We're not called to be, we're not called to an ascetic life like a monastic. The, the early church in the early centuries got that all confused. They live a monastic life. That wasn't God's plan. No. God in His grace, He intends us to glorify Him in the midst of enjoying His blessings that He's given to us and yet still loving Him above all things, all those things and looking forward to His Son's return. Is that you? Well, the Thessalonians needed a reminder. They needed specifics to show them that Christ hadn't returned yet. And so Paul, in the next verses, he's going to give some clear truth. He's going to give some clear explanations why they could to relieve their hearts. They had not missed the return of Christ. No matter what this false letter had said, Christ was still coming back. They could look forward to that with great anticipation and live for his glory. Because what's the point of this passage? Be mindful of Christ's return to gather his people and judge the wicked. Be mindful of Christ's return to gather his people and judge the wicked. We've seen, don't be disturbed. Don't be confused. Let's look secondly at don't be deceived. Look at verse 3. Don't be deceived. Then no, let no one in any way deceive you. For it, the return of Christ, will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. This is a, a warning to every believer. Paul calls the Thessalonians not to be deceived, so also for us, not to be deceived. By false teaching, we're deceived here means to, to, to delude something completely. And Paul is basically very kindly, very kindly chiding them, saying, you should have known better. Uh, you should have realized that, that Paul wouldn't have written a letter that contradicted what he had so recently taught them in person and what he'd written them in his first letter. He's not going to write them another letter that just contradicts everything that he already told them and everything he'd already written them. So Paul declares that they could know that the day of the Lord had not come. Christians throughout church history could know that the day of the Lord had not come because there were two obvious events that had to precede it. Had to precede it. And then the next verses, he's going to tell us what those two events are. What's the first event? The first thing that will happen. It's called the apostasy. The apostasy. The great apostasy. You say, what is apostasy? Now, apostasy doesn't refer to someone who doesn't want to have anything to do with Christ and never has. No, apostasy implies that a person was once a participant or a follower of something and they abandoned what they had once claimed to believe. That's what this is talking about. People that had uh, said that they were Christians, people that say they are followers of Christ, and yet they turn away. Now, if you know church history, certainly throughout church history, uh, there have been apostates, even in our generation. There have been a number that claim Christ, and then for, for various reasons, they turn away from Him. They reject the gospel. 
That happens throughout church history. And yet Paul is talking about something different here. Some, Paul is talking about something much more significant. And he used the definite article and he calls it the apostasy. This is the apostasy. Sometimes this is called the great apostasy. This is a final end time apostasy that will include a substantial number of people that claim to be Christian. Because when persecution really heats up at the end, many will abandon Christ when it becomes more costly to follow Him. Things are not getting better and better. No, at the end, there will be many that claim to be Christians that will turn away from Christ. Now, this isn't just Paul, is it? Christ predicted this in Matthew 24, 9 to 10. It says, Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, here's what he, how Christ describes it, many will fall away. He's talking about people that claim to be Christians. Many will fall away and will betray one another and will hate one another. This will be a level of apostasy and abandoning Christ that Christ's church has never seen up to this point. Now, true believers don't need to fear. It's not true believers aren't going to lose their salvation. That's not possible. You'll be held fast, or whoever believers there will be held fast by the power of Christ. They won't be deceived. They won't fall away. But those that have claimed Christianity, and yet when it becomes very costly, when it was, con when it was convenient, when it was comfortable, when it was easy, they followed Christ. But when it becomes costly, there will be a great number of so-called Christians that will turn away. And we'll abandon Christ because it's too difficult. Things in the world will get worse. It will become more and more costly to become a Christian, particularly at the end. Particularly at the end, many so-called Christians will deny the faith and will abandon Christ. It's not hard for us to see how that could happen, is it? And so Paul is saying, though, that this hasn't happened yet. That's his whole point. This hasn't happened yet. It's clear. There hasn't been a great apostasy. There hasn't been a, a great turning away from Christ. And so the Thessalonian believers could know, okay, that hasn't happened yet. We haven't missed the coming of Christ. Christ hasn't come back. Christ hasn't gathered his people together. So in countering the false teaching the day of the Lord had come, Paul's first point is that there will be a, a great apostasy, an apostasy like has never happened before that will precede the coming of Christ. There's a second indicator that he puts in this passage, a second indicator. The first was the apostasy. What's the second indicator? Look at verse 3. He said, let no one in any way deceive you. It will not come unless the apostasy, we saw that, comes first. But then secondly... And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Paul is here referring to the, the most wicked human being that will ever live. In verse 3 here, what does he call him? The man of lawlessness. In other words, he, he, doesn't want to, he doesn't care anything about God's truth. He doesn't care anything about what God has said is right and wrong. He, and then he also calls him the son of destruction. Down in verse 9, he calls him the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan. He is not Satan, but he is directly empowered by Satan. All of these titles are of the one who in other places in God's word is known as the Antichrist. The big A, Antichrist. What is the Antichrist? The Antichrist is an end times individual. He's a true person. He's a God-denying, Christ-hating, wicked religious leader like the world would have never seen before. And all we've, our world in history has seen many evil, wicked rulers. In a sense, he'll be the compilation and worse than all of them combined. First John 2.18 says, Children, it's the last hour. When did John write that? First century. He said it was the last hour then. That means we're even closer. It's the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, they knew even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. 
Beloved, there have been many antichrists throughout church his, throughout history, but the final antichrist will be far worse than any other. There are some horrible ones, worse than Antiochus Epiphanes, who slaughtered a pig in the Holy of Holies and desecrated the temple in the second century B.C. And down through history, there have been many, many, many others. And he will be directly empowered by Satan. What does he call him at the end of verse 3? He calls him the son of destruction. What is that? Why does he call him that? Because that's what he's headed to. One, he causes destruction, but also he will be headed to destruction. See that little phrase, son of destruction? There's only one other individual in the Bible who is given that same title, the son of destruction. Who is it? Judas. Judas, the only other person who is called the son of destruction. This title is... is reserved for the two most evil humans in all of history. Both of these individuals are totally controlled by Satan. Both of these individuals are guilty of doing two of the most heinous acts of wickedness. Judas betrays the very Son of God. The Antichrist, we'll see next week, will declare himself to be God. He will say, I am God. He will call the whole world to worship him as God. The Antichrist, this man, will be the culmination of all those who hate God. He will be the culmination of all those who hate Christ. Look what he says there in verse 4. Who opposes and Paul is going to give you some subscription. Why? Because he wants them to be able to identify who this individual is so they can know, no, that hasn't happened yet. There have been some really bad leaders, but that hasn't happened yet. So he gives a lot of detail so they'll be able to identify, has this individual come yet? If he hasn't come yet, then they could have confidence. Who, verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. The Antichrist, he will exalt himself above the one true God, but also above every other so-called deity. He exalts himself above the true God of the Christians or any other, even the false gods, objects of worship. He will be energized by Satan. He will have immense power, worldwide power, to successfully demand that the entire world must worship him. If you know your Bible, you're familiar with the book of Daniel. And the prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 speaks of this same individual. He says in Daniel 9, 27, the prophet Daniel says that this individual, the Antichrist, will sign a treaty, a, a peace treaty, a covenant with Israel. He will bring peace to the Middle East. You say, well, why is there no peace in the Middle East? Because it is waiting this individual. He will become a so-called, not truly, but he will come a, become a so-called protector of Israel. He will look like he's very religious. He will control the world. But then, halfway through the tribulation, his true colors will be revealed in a particular act of heinous wickedness. Look at the end of verse 4. Paul tells you, what will he do? He will take his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. So this tells us that, and Paul is talking future, this tells us that Jerusalem still has great significance. Now there is no temple at this point, so at some point there will have to be some form of, of temple rebuilt. There will have to be some form where the Jews will reinstitute some form of, of Judaism or, or, or worship. Um, but Jerusalem still has great significance. After his second coming, Christ will rule and reign from Jerusalem during his millennial kingdom, we believe. What other place on the earth would be more perfect for Satan to orchestrate the ultimate blasphemy against the one true God and against his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, than in Jerusalem, in the temple? So the Antichrist, it says in this text, he, he will go into the temple. He will desecrate the temple. That means evidently there will be a temple that will re be rebuilt in Jerusalem. The Jews will have peace. Their religion will be restored in, in some way. Uh, but then in the middle of the seven-year tribulation that the Apostle John talks about in the book of Revelation, when everything looks wonderful, everything looks great, there's, there's a peace like this world has never known, 
The Antichrist will reveal its true colors. Its true colors. And he will commit what the prophet Daniel calls the abomination of desolation, which is very the same event that Paul talks about here in 2 Thessalonians 2.4. Daniel 9.27 says he will make a firm covenant with the many, with the Jews, for one week. But in the middle of the week, in the middle of the seven-year tribulation, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offerings. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who, is, who makes desolate. And so what does he do? We don't know exactly what he does. It doesn't give us the details, but somehow it's associated with the temple. Somehow it's associated with demanding that people worship him and not the one true God. Look at the end of verse 4. It says, he takes his seat. The, the word seat, if you look at the scripture, it has the idea of authority. He takes his seat as if he is the divine authority. He takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. That was the, the sin of Satan when he fell, right? That he would be like God. It's the same sin here. Most heinous of all, he will proclaim himself to be God. He will demand that people worship him. And, and then if you're familiar with the book of Revelation, you know that he will launch a, a reign of terror. Three and a half years in the last part of the tribulation, he will seek to kill anyone who names the name of Christ. He will seek to, to wipe out, to crush, to destroy, to kill every Jew. We've seen that throughout history. Many times people, um, world leaders have tried tried to kill the Jews. That's nothing new. And yet this one will focus everything in the world at that. But then Christ will return. Revelation 19, Christ will return in glory, in glory. We'll see that next week when Christ returns. And he will destroy the Antichrist. He will destroy the Antichrist, wicked kingdom. And there will be no battle. It will be completely one-sided. And the Lord will cast him into the lake of fire with the false prophets. And Christ will set up his thousand-year millennial kingdom. Now you may sit here and say, John, it's kind of early in the morning for that much information. I mean, that's just a little, I'm a little bit on overload, kind of trying to process all that. My, my mind's reeling with all these details. Now, don't miss Paul's main point. What's the, the main point? Why does he give all these details? Why is he so specific? The goal isn't so that they could make a big chart and put it on the wall and get everything lined up exactly how it will line up. That's not the point. What's the point? The point is that they were shaken. They were disturbed. They thought Christ had come back and they had missed it. And so Paul settles their concerns. You haven't missed it. Christ is still going to come back. Yes, live for his glory as you go through difficult persecution. Live for his glory knowing that you have the hope that Christ is coming back and one day you will stand before him. He settles their concerns. They hadn't missed it. There are two very specific things that had to happen before the day of the Lord. And since those things hadn't happened, since there hadn't been a great apostasy, since there hadn't been an individual called the Antichrist that had done these very specific things, he had not been revealed. There had not been an Antichrist who had taken his place in the temple and the abomination of desolations. Therefore, those things hadn't happened. They could have peace. They could have peace. They could live holy lives in anticipation, holy lives that persevered, that clung to the hope, the hope that every Christian has as they long to be with Christ. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 is a, a, a real um, subtle chiding. He says, don't you remember? Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things. So this isn't all new information. No. Paul subtly implies that they had been given sufficient instruction to evaluate, to reject the false teaching that had so confused them. They just needed to remember. They need to apply the apostolic instruction, which they already had, which is really the key issue even for us as we battle against error. Remember, remember what God has said. So Paul's whole point whole point as they could confidently know that Christ's second coming had not occurred. They had not missed his gathering together his people to himself. Why? Because the great apostasy hadn't happened yet. 
Even may have been, there may have been a few people that denied Christ, but no, there hadn't been a great apostasy. And clearly the Antichrist had not been revealed yet, Eddie Wood. They hadn't missed it. And they should live in anticipation of Christ coming back and gathering his people. Now there's a natural question that comes from this passage, and I understand that question. What is that question? Well, when's it going to happen? Come on, just fill in the blanks, put it on the chart. When will the rapture occur? When will Christ return to gather his people? Now, if you're familiar with the rapture, you know that there are different perspectives, different viewpoints, different interpretations on that, which, as we already talked about at the beginning of this passage, there it's, it's understandable. Some would say that, see, see, if the key indicators for them are that the apostasy, the great apostasy must come first, and that Christ must be revealed, then it seems that the Christ will not rapture his people prior to the seven-year tribulation. Others would say... Well, believers will be raptured prior to the tribulation and the revealing of the Antichrist. Otherwise, they'd go through the wrathful judgments of the tribulation. In 1 Thessalonians 1.10, Paul said, Christ delivers us from the wrath to come. So which is it? Well, the point of this passage isn't to nail down the timing of the rapture, even though that's what we'd like. That's what we like. That's not Paul's point here, for them or for us. The point of this passage, beloved, is to give believers confidence, confidence that they haven't missed Christ's second coming. They haven't missed his gathering together of his people. And when we try to take this passage and we try to push this passage to say more than it does, we can focus more on the timing of the end time events when the purpose is to compel us to live in the here and now for the glory of God. Anticipation, Maranatha, even so come Lord Jesus. And next week, we're going to look at verses 6 through 12, and it'll give more insight into those end time events. But Paul still won't answer that question in that passage. So what implications? from this for you this morning. What implications? Beloved, do you long for Christ's appearing? I think that's a natural implication for this. Do you long for Christ's appearing? As we look around, things in this world seem to get worse and worse. Ten years ago, 20 years ago, five years ago, one year ago, who could have been imagined where we would be at today? Where we'd be at today? Things seem to be getting worse and worse. We, we can be overwhelmed with, with fear. We can be overwhelmed with anxiousness. But rather than overwhelm us with fear and anxiousness and worry, what should these things do? As you look around the world, these should give us a greater longing, a greater anticipation that Christ is coming back. It should give us a greater hope in Christ's return. Beloved, it's very easy to, to gather together and have uh, wine, complain, and grumble sessions together as we look at the decay and decadence of our world. We need to be careful. What can we expect? What can we expect? The, the scripture is very clear. It's not going to get better and better. It's not. It's not. The passage just tells us it's going to get worse and worse. In fact, right at the end, it's going to get really bad, really bad. But what should that cause us to do? Fuel our hearts. Fuel our hearts with a longing, with more hope in Christ's return. And beloved, we need to remind each other of that. As we hear bad news, as someone shares with us bad news, what's the answer? But Christ is coming back. Jesus is coming back. We need to long for his return. 2 Timothy 4.8 says, in the future, beloved, here's your future. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Is that just for Paul? No which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, you're included in this verse, but also to all who have loved his appearing. What does that passage tell us that defines what a Christian is? We long for his appearing. We long for his return. Paul knew that if the Thessalonians had a clear, had lost a clear view of Christ's return, they'd have little, little reason or perspective to live. What's the point of going through this persecution if this is all there is? That's why he goes into detail to remind them. And the Spirit uses that to remind us that the Christ is still coming back. And beloved, that's a perspective that you need for all of life. You need for all of life. Every situation in life, when you're fearful, maybe in a situation that's causing you great fear for yourself or for a loved one, hope in Christ's return. When you're discouraged, 
Things aren't going the way you'd anticipate or hope. Dreams aren't being fulfilled. Hope in Christ. Return when you're discouraged. You see your own failures. Hope in Christ's return. When you're overwhelmed, I, I can't do what God has called me to do. Hope in Christ's return. When you're sorrowful, something very sad, very difficult happens. Hope in Christ's return. When you are blessed, when God just continues to pour out on you again and again his blessings, hope in Christ's return. When you are thankful, hope in Christ's return. Beloved, hoping in Christ's return, that's what will give you perspective for every situation you face in this life. And that's why Paul goes to such ends, and that's why the Holy Spirit allows us to have what Paul wrote so that we would be able to know, no, Christ hasn't returned yet. We can and must hope in his return because that's what will give us the perspective that we need. So what's the thrust of this passage? Be mindful of Christ's return to gather his people and judge the wicked. You've seen two things. Don't be disturbed. Don't be deceived. Have you given in to either of those? Are you disturbed? Are you deceived? If you look at the rearview mirror of this past week, how much have you thought about Christ's return? Well, this is a reminder for you to consider, to hope in Christ's return. Alexander McLaren was a 19th century, he was Scottish actually, but he ministered as a pastor in England uh, for over 56 years. 44 of those years, Alexander McLaren, he preached Sunday after Sunday to the Union Chapel Church in Manchester, England. And one of McLaren's greatest concerns for his people was that they would live in light of eternity that they would have a a clear view of Christ's return. Like the Apostle Paul, McLaren knew that his people needed a perspective on the second coming of Christ that would motivate them, that would move them in this life to live fully for his glory. McLaren once said, quote, The apostolic church thought more about the second coming of Jesus Christ than about death and heaven. The early Christians were looking not for a cleft in the ground called a grave, but for a cleavage in the sky called glory, unquote. Beloved, is that your heart? Is that your heart? Do you have a longing? Do you have anticipation of Christ coming back? Would the the Thessalonians' concern, would their fear, would that even have shaken you? Would that even have bothered you? Well, they had such a passion return of Christ, it did. By God's grace, may our greatest desire be the return of Christ, standing before Him. May all other joys point us ahead and remind us of the greatest joy we have when we're with Christ. May all other difficulties be mere momentary light afflictions that hone our desire all the more for Christ so that we would pray and we would say, even so come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's pray. Talk to the Lord. How is it needful for you this morning to have this reminder from God that you would have a a perspective that would long for and look for Christ's return? Maybe there has been a great difficulty this week, sorrow, struggle, How would perspective of Christ soon return, anticipating that, give you a perspective for that? Maybe there's been great blessing this week, great joy, great delight. How would that, how should that give you even a greater longing for the return of Christ? Talk to the Lord. Lord Jesus, we would say, even so come. Lord Jesus, come. Thank you for this reminder from your word. We know that you haven't come back yet. The Thessalonians were confused. It brought them great fear. I pray that we who know that you haven't come back yet, that we would live in anticipation, anticipation of your soon return, or if we should die in you, anticipation of standing before you in glory. 
May that cause us to to live for your glory today. May that cause us to make decisions um, that reflect you. May that cause us to, the way we speak, that would flow out of our mouths. May that cause the things that we think about, they would be focused on the things of you. May that give uh, sweet balm uh, for every struggle, every fear, every difficulty, but also may it give sweet perspective for every blessing that would cause us long all the more for the blessing of standing before you, Christ. In your precious name we pray.